we don't have to wait for eternity. It is possible to become ourselves in the fullest ego transcending form, even in this life. What I may call the messages of Brave New World, that it is possible uh, to make people contented with their servitude. I think this can be done. I think it has been done in the past, but then I think it could be done even more effectively now because you can provide them with bread and circuses and you can provide them with endless amounts of distractions and propaganda. October the 21st, 1949. Dear Mr. Orwell, the nightmare of 1984 is destined to modulate into the nightmare of Brave New World. The change will be brought about as a result of a felt need for increased efficiency. Thank you once again for the book. Yours sincerely, Aldous Huxley. Well, what is to me very interesting, it looks as though the totalitarian regimes of the future will not be based upon terror because they will have other means. These means will now at present described as brainwashing and, and propaganda, which will be much more efficient and much more economical than uh, and pleasurable of course, and more pleasurable to those uh, who undergo them. Because I mean, there are techniques uh, uh, available at present which do seem to duplicate some of the techniques that I invented. 1936, when you wrote Brave New World, uh, there was a kind of uh, certainly implicit pessimism here about the future, about man. Yes, and unfortunately, of course, uh, I, I put all the events in Brave New World in the seventh century after Ford, uh, and a great deal of it has come true within 27 years, or whatever the period is since I wrote it. I'm, I'm often very alarmed of, uh, at what uh, has already happened in the way of... Um, the prophecy is being fulfilled. And I do think that uh, we seem to be moving in that direction, that there seem to be a number of impersonal forces pushing that way and a number of technological discoveries which can be used to accelerate the movement in that direction. Is the problem, I mean, uh, I think that this is perhaps one of the major problems of our time. Uh, how do we make use of this thing. I mean, after all, this was stated in the Gospel. Uh, man, uh, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. And in the same way, uh, technology was made for man and not man for technology. But unfortunately, the development of, uh, of recent uh, social and scientific history has created a world in which man seems to be made for technology rather than the other way around. The word freedom perhaps is... Uh, too vague a term in this sort of context. I think what we have to ask is what sort of a, of a social pattern and what sort of a political regime is best calculated to help the individuals within the society and to realize the maximum extent of their desirable potentialities. I mean, it's quite obvious that most of us are functioning at about 10% of capacity and that wouldn't it be nice if we could function at 20%. As a matter of fact, I've just uh, finished a, a, a kind of utopian fantasy, which is the opposite of Brave New World, which is about a society in which a serious effort is made to help its members to realize their desirable potentialities. And I've gone into, I mean, this is an attempt to write what may be called a practical utopia. To, nothing is easier, of course, than to... Uh, to enunciate ideals and to say, well, wouldn't it be nice if everybody were good and kind and loving, etc., etc.? Of course it would be very nice, but uh, the point is, uh, how do you implement these ideals? How do you fulfill your good social and uh, psychological intentions? And when you come down to this problem, you see it's a very complex problem of organizing family life, organizing education, organizing sexual life, organizing social and economic life. I mean, there are endless factors involved in this. And to try to work out what all these factors should be is a, I must say, I found a, a very interesting job. 1929. Huxley picks up Henry Ford's My Life and Works in a ship's library between Java and Borneo. In these seas, 
and to one fresh from India and Indian spirituality, Indian dirt and religion, Henry Ford seems a greater man than Buddha. In Europe, on the other hand, and still more, no doubt, in America, the way of Guatemala has all the appearance of the way of salvation. One is all for religion until one visits a really religious country. There, one is all for drains, machinery, and the minimum wage. To travel is to discover everybody is wrong. Well, I would call it a, a kind of a, attempt to understand things. I mean, this is what I feel about myself. I mean, I, I've tried to learn all through my life as much as possible, and I've sort of tried to drop down what I feel I've lear learned, and I think consequently there se may seem to be a number of inconsistencies in what I've written, but uh, this, I hope, is due to the fact that I've begun to learn new things and been able to look at things in a different way, and if the work has any value, it represents uh, the record of a long learning process. Again, I don't think there's any incompatibility between science and mysticism. No, no. I mean, it's the only form of, I mean, this kind of imminent religion is the only form of religion which, in which there is no conflict at all that I can see between uh, science and, uh, uh, and religion. In Houston, senior advisor to the United Nations on matters of human development. In March of 1963, when I was just barely out of my teens, I woke up to a phone call from a friend. Aldous Huxley wants to meet you. Me? What? Me? And I couldn't figure out why, except that I had the only legal supply of LSD in New York City. <laughs> we have to explore the inner world as well as the outer world, and it's quite clear that if we remain fixed as behaviorists solely on the outer world, we miss half the essence of life. The most audacious form of Huxley's escapism, mysticism as a means to that escapism, was reasonably honorable but that he should now arrive at drugs, I find rather scandalous. Encouraged by the persuasive recommendations of the famous author, many young Englishmen, especially Americans, will try the experiment. An irresponsible book in as much as it uh, permits, under suitable research conditions, the exploration of the stranger and odder areas of the human mind. I mean, this is one of the things which uh, has emerged, I think, in recent years. Not only is the material universe incomparably larger and stranger than we used to give it any credit for, but the mental universe is also larger and stranger than we give it credit for, that we carry about inside our skulls uh, an extraordinary world, a visionary world, a mystical world, uh, and that uh, the interesting fact about these uh, substances is that they open a door and permit us, without doing any harm to ourselves, because this is the most extraordinary fact about these new drugs, uh, without doing physiological harm, to explore this world. He was also courteous to a fault. Someone had given me a six-foot panda for Christmas, which I had propped up in a chair in the living room. Because his vision was so poor, and because he was so courteous, Aldous Huxley would address remarks to me and then to the panda. I had not the heart to tell him the truth about the silent guest. This produces a of what may be called a kind of pre-mystical or even a mystical experience. Do you advocate it, as I understand you have, as a uh, sort of substitute for alcohol, as a means for escape? Well, no, no, not as uh, in its present form, but I mean, I think uh, probably, again, uh, this we can look forward to. I would think that probably within 50 years, pharmacology will have discovered a much more satisfactory substitute for alcohol. But uh, 
these particular things, I think, could be used in an extremely valuable way. I mean, as they stand, they are not uh, for general use because they, they just uh, throw people out for too long a time. But uh, they, they are, they, they are capable of, of enlarging people's minds and of making them discover who and what they are. I mean, they are real tools for helping to obey the Socratic injunction, know thyself. On November 22nd, 1963, the same day that John F. Kennedy was assassinated, Aldous Huxley died. Ill with cancer, Huxley was on his deathbed when he used LSD for the final time. You know, I think we are capable of looking at the world uh, as uh, Spinoza said, uh, under the aspect of eternity in a kind of timeless way, perceiving things, so to speak, as they are, not uh, through the veil of our concepts and notions about them. Matter is potentiality. That's what the world is. A probable description of many possible alternatives. But with each opportunity that causes the wave function to collapse... There's the subatomic particle if you want to get technical about it. A small part of the universe is made real. So I conclude with a poem by a compatriot of his, who I think spoke to Aldous when he wrote the words of Christopher Fry. The human heart can go to the lengths of God. If you don't like God, substitute emerging evolutionary process. <laughs> the human heart can go to the lengths of God. Dark and cold we may be, but this is no winter now. The frozen misery of centuries cracks, breaks, begins to move. The thunder is the thunder of the flood, the flow, the upstart spring. <laughs> Thank God. Our time is now. Hmm? The enterprise is exploration into God. What are you making for? Hmm? It takes so many thousand years to wake. But when you wake, for pity's sake, Aldous Huxley woke up. We must do the same.